Okay, yes, they're finishing up here. Um, we're gonna, you guys, you, you're finishing up, right? Yeah. Okay, so if we could, if we could begin, and if we could go, uh, we could go back to page 30 in our notes. And if you could open up your Ryrie book to page 379 as well, under the security of the believer, just kind of back up a little bit on this tulip. We didn't pray actually either since we didn't really, it was, it's just kind of like unofficially started. So why don't we have a word of prayer as we begin? And um, let me ask JJ out there. JJ, could you please pray for us tonight? Okay. Yeah, we, we can hear you, I think. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you. Um, last night of um, heritage, not heritage, uh, the uh, Bible Institute word. Um, I pray as we go through um, the um, New Testament and later, uh, the later class in the Old Testament, and I pray that um would not just listen to it and agree on it but i pray that um it will change us i pray that um it will conform us into what you um want for us lord um pray for this night pray for pastor and um, those who will be presenting their presentations um all is in your name in your name amen thank you jj okay so I wanted to just back up to the five points of Calvinism for a moment. And because we, we just basically filled those blanks. And I think at the end of the class, um, so total depravity, we did mention that Calvinists say that man is so totally depraved. And we did spend a little time with that, that he has to be regenerated by the Holy spirit before he can believe. So that's really the first domino of Calvinism. And is foundationally why I'm not a Calvinist, because once you believe regeneration is before faith, all the other five points do fall like dominoes. So I'm not prepared to probably explain each of these terms and how I probably have nuance of difference between them, but I could maybe explain a couple things. Um, in other words, I would agree with the, in the statement total depravity, but I don't mean it the same way a Calvinist would. I, I believe that total depravity simply means we cannot save ourselves. We need a savior. We cannot be saved by our works, period. We're totally depraved in that sense. Unconditional election. I, I do believe in election and God's, God's choice, and we'll talk about that, but that does not discount human responsibility. Limited atonement, I would, on its surface, on, on its face, I, I would reject that one outright. Um, of course, you know, we believe that he died for all the world. Irresistible grace, I would just give you one verse, Acts chapter 7, verse 51, where Stephen was pre uh, preaching just before he was stoned. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So he's talking about the Jewish people who were the chosen nation. So the idea of Calvinism is that if you've been, if you're, in other words, if you've been regenerated, you can't resist believing, right? I mean, that, that makes sense intellectually. Um, but so they're looking at this in, in an order, in other words, like you've already been regenerated. So if you've already been regenerated before you believe, you can't not not believe, see? But what we would say is somebody's confronted with the gospel, the Holy Spirit could be convicting them, the Holy Spirit could be drawing them, and yet man could still resist and reject the Lord. So God's grace is wonderful, but man does resist it. Sad to say, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, but man has resisted the Holy Spirit of God. So I don't agree with that. The, the fifth point, perseverance of the saints. And, and I'm glad that Ryrie actually, and this is where I would go to Ryrie, if you look at page 379, 
And he brings out how in his chapter, he entitles it security of the believer. And he talks about in some theologies, this expression security or having assurance of salvation is often referred to as perseverance or preservation as the Calvinists refer to it as the, the perseverance of the saints. And I think he makes a good distinction. And, and I, I don't really prefer the statement perseverance of the saints because it puts the emphasis on the saints <laughs> and our eternal security is not ultimately based on us. It's based on the grace of God that saved us. So that's why I don't think I've ever said from the pulpit, we have, we can know the perseverance of the saints. We, I usually use the term eternal security or assurance of salvation. So, and he, he talks about that here, and I, I think it's a good, a good point he makes. Uh, on the second paragraph, he says, eternal security is the work of God that guarantees the gift of salvation once received is forever and cannot be lost. So I'm a thousand percent right there. We cannot lose our salvation. And it's the Lord who keeps us saved. We're not kept saved through our works. And, and that's the problem to me with that expression, perseverance of the saints. It's almost like the saints persevere through good works and therefore remain saved. Or it could give that a, a, it could give that sense anyway, and, and that's what he says here. So look at this fourth paragraph down. He says, perseverance, the term generally used in Calvinism, labels the fifth point of Calvin's theology, final perseverance of the saints. It means that believers can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. It seems to focus on the believer. It is the believer who perseveres albeit through the decree and power of God. Security focuses on God. It is God who secures our salvation. So it's a nuance of difference. And I'm not going to completely condemn Calvinists for how they say that, but I just prefer the expression eternal security. So I wanted to, any questions about that or any other comments? Anyone want to add to that? Okay, so another thing I just want to say quick is we're not going to finish this section on salvation. So our next class will continue with the theology, and we'll, we'll continue this. But I would like to finish the Calvinist, at least the Calvinism or election tonight. And then I, I don't want to just rush over the other things. Are you going to talk about like universal election? Because I wasn't sure what that term was. Is that in the book? Yeah, they were talking about universal. Did you know where that was in the book? If you could find that, yeah, we could talk about that. That's not the same as unconditional election. No, I don't think so. Okay, so if you go to your notes, you can find that, Esther, and let me know. But on page 31, um, let me, I'm sorry. You know what? Let me just back up also. I want to make another point and. And I'm not an expert on all these things, really. I'm not. Um, but if you go back to page 29, the history of the debate, uh, Augustine, who was really a Catholic, Augustine laid a lot of foundational doctrines of the Catholic Church, even the later uh, persecutions against Christians in order to keep people in the church. I mean, I'm not saying Augustine did that, but he, he laid some, some foundation for that. Um, so I don't agree with Augustine on everything, and I don't agree with Pelagius on everything. So Pelagius, and, and if you might want to just mark this on page 254, he talks about Pelagianism. Basically, Pelagius said that man is born neither holy or sinful, and so that man is, is born neutral. And so, by but when he sins, then he becomes a sinner. So Pelagian did not believe in that man is born in sin with a sinful nature. And, you know, and, and Finney did take on some of that theology as well, uh, and not to completely criticize uh, the evangelist uh, uh, Finney, but he, he did have some kind of Pelagian or at least a semi-Pelagian view. So I disagree with both Augustine and Pelagian, really, you know, in this debate. But just the point that 
there was always a debate between, you know, a, a election and a free will, if you will. And then uh, Luther, I don't agree with Luther <laughs> either. You know, Luther, a persecuted Baptist, and he, he believed in the state church and infant baptism. And I mean, I, I commend him for his courage to stand up to the Catholic church, but uh, I, I don't, I'm not a, you know, totally sold on, on Martin Luther. I love his hymn, Mighty Fortress is Our God, you know, things like that. So, you know, people that we don't agree with, they, they still give us good things. But, and Erasmus, he was a Catholic too, from my understanding, you know, and Erasmus did some good things as well. But so they had the, this debate. And then later on, Calvin, who I don't fully agree with, and Arminius. Now, Arminius believed you could lose your salvation. So I don't agree with Arminian. I'm not an Arminian. I'm not a Calvinist, really, you know. So I, 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 don't, I don't take either side on this. I take a middle, I do take a middle ground, if you will. But I, I think the, the point to, that I just want to emphasize again through this, I, and when I, when I heard this, I was like, wow, I didn't know that. I always thought like Calvin came up with five points, or at least the five points of Calvinism came out of his theology. But, but when I heard that, really, the, the five points of Calvinism came as a rebuttal to Arminians who came up with five points of Arminianism, and then the five points of Calvinism came to rebut that. I think that's valuable in history to know. Um, yeah. Um, it's on 367. But it's 367. About, it's about atonement. So they were talking that's about okay. um, universal redemption or unlimited atonement. And then on 368, they were talking about um, yeah, universal redemption. <laughs> so like, on 368? Yeah. So it go, there's like a sentence. Um, where? What page? on? Where on page? On 368 at the top. The yeah, and then it starts on 367 at the bottom. So like Arminians accept universal redemption, unlimited atonement. Okay, so if you could go to your Ryrie book for just a moment, Estrahan has a question about this. On page 367, the extent of the atonement, the views, Arminians accept universal redemption or, un or unlimited atonement along with the idea that sufficient grace is supplied to all that they may believe. So his expression there, universal redemption, which again, I don't really use, that's a synonym for an unlimited atonement in this, in this context. In other words, that the redemption provided by Jesus Christ is universally available. That's how I read that. Yeah. Not that everybody's saved. Right. Among Calvinists, there are some who hold to universal redemption. Some are called four-point Calvinists. Actually, I've, I, haven't, I haven't read the Institutes e either by Calvin. You know, I haven't. But I have read some of what Calvin has written in theology books and things. And Calvin did make some statements that seem to indicate he may have believed Christ did die for everyone, you know. So again, people later came on and said it's a point of Calvinism. I'm not sure Calvin believed that. I'm not sure. OK, but nevertheless, um, you know, you know what Calvinists would say, though, as well, is if you believe that Christ died for every man and that not every man is saved, that Christ's blood was shed in vain for all those men that weren't saved. And it would it would be a, a, a shedding of, of his blood in vain. And. And so Calvinists say, if you believe that Christ died for everyone, you have to believe that everyone is ultimately universally saved, which obviously we would not agree to that either, you know. Okay, does that, did that answer your question? Yeah, on that, it was just all these terms. On that term, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, let's, let's go forward here now. The right approach toward this, we have to have reverence, we have to have humility. The secret things belong to the Lord. That's a good verse for when we don't understand things, which is quite often. <laughs> but the secret things belong to the Lord. And then we have to have the right beliefs. You have to have the right attitude, but we have to have the right beliefs. And those three things there, to me, are foundational. This is what I'm sure about. When I'm not sure about how this whole thing works out, 
I can be sure that God is omniscient, that he knows everything. He knows at the beginning, the end, and at the end, he knows everything that's ever happened. He's omniscient. He's all knowing. I don't doubt that. And I know that, okay, based on the Bible. And I, I believe that man is responsible. We are commanded to repent. We are commanded to believe. We are commanded to come. If we weren't responsible, we wouldn't be commanded to do those things. We're commanded to do many things and even related to salvation. We're commanded. So God commands men dead in their sin to believe because faith is not a work and dead men can believe when the word of God comes into their heart. But man is responsible and God is sovereign. That is, he, he rules and overrules. God is king. That's the sovereignty of God. He's the king. He's the Lord. He rules, overrules. So putting those three things together, it does lead me to believe in what Calvinists would call a particular redemption. Basically, my understanding of that is that at the beginning, when at the beginning, and even before the beginning, from eternity past, because God is omniscient, he knew at the end a particular number of people who are going to be saved. And because you're important, I believe he knew you were going to be saved at the end from the very eternity past. You're important. We're all important. Our souls are important to God, right? So does that make, to me, I, I don't have any problem believing mm -hmm. that from eternity past, God knew at the end, in eternity, who was going to be there with him. Do you have, I don't have any problem with that myself. Based on the omniscience of God and his sovereign rule over all of creation from beginning to end. So that's called particular redemption. In other words, there's a particular number of people that are saved. Now, from our view, it's like a multitude of multitudes. <laughs> we can't, an innumerable, but God knows every soul. Okay. So that's the elect. <laughs> that's the elect. Now, I have no idea who they are. And I'm not so, I, God doesn't tell us who they are. So don't worry about it. Okay. So known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Okay. So with that in, in view, go to the next page. And you could stop me if you have any questions. And because I am going to, I'm not going to ask for you to read anything just so I could try to get through. If you, but if you have to want to say anything, help yourself. And I'm sorry that I'm not going to involve you very much here tonight. But okay, so here are the three major terms. And Ryrie also has these terms in the chapter on, on election. And the three terms are election, which is eklektos, which means to pick out, to choose for oneself. And I'm just going to put all the blanks on this page up. Predestination, pro horizo, to mark out or determine beforehand, to pre-plan a destiny. That's Ryrie's terminology as well. And then foreknowledge, prognosco, gnosis is knowledge, pro is before, so foreknowledge intimate knowledge beforehand and let me let me just stop on that and if you can go in your book to page 358 and he has these terms also so these are the three terms now i gave you a sheet on election and i actually looked up every time the word elect, eclectos, or one of its derivatives is in the New Testament. So the word means pick out or select. It's translated elect, or a derivative of, the, of this 24 time elect, election, elects. In the New Testament, it's, it's translated choose, one of its forms about 29 times. So this is about every, this is every time I could find. And I found it's used regarding Christ, regarding angels, Regard making a choice, like Mary has chosen the best part. It's used regarding net Israel as an elect nation. It's used regarding the apostles or deacons chosen to service. So it's used for choice to service. It's used of the, the election of Paul. It's used of Peter to preach. 
It's used of disciples for particular service, but then it is used regarding those who are saved. It's used regarding salvation, and that's most of its use. Now, what's interesting on this is, is Jesus, you know, when he said many are called, but few are chosen, elect us. <laughs> but Paul, every time Paul uses that term, chosen or elect, it is unto salvation. So, but Jesus said, many are called, uh, I'm sorry, the, the word calling. Paul uses the word calling, I meant to say. When Paul uses the word calling, he uses it for being chosen. Jesus seems to say some are called, but not everyone is elect. Some are called, but not all who are called are actually going to be saved or, or chosen. But Paul, when he uses the word called, like in Romans chapter 8, and from my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe this is accurate. When Paul uses the word called, he uses it pretty synonymously to being chosen, such as in Romans chapter 8, verse 30. You might want to turn there, and we'll, we'll look at that verse also. But Paul said in Romans 8, 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. So the word called there is synonymous to me of being elect. It's not that same word, but because in, later on in verse 33 of this passage, he says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So anyway. Um, just wanted to make that point. And, and th this is why this is hard for us to understand, too. I mean, to me, that's difficult saying of Jesus. Many are called, but few are chosen. But Paul uses that term called, like I said, pretty much to speak of those who are chosen. So that's that's something to, to consider and diff difficult to, to, to unravel. But, you know, there's different ways to, to look at it. Charlie, yeah, you'd like to make a point? I was going to say, couldn't, couldn't he just, like, say calling be like hours of year you're making a a general this, call this, yeah a this, general this, call this, yeah this, that's how it's often used like a, a general call and then a particular call kind of a thing yeah so this this isn't like really a great analogy but like say uh you know you're a pickup game you're at the court all right who wants to play you're making a general call. Yeah. And then the guy that says, hey, I do. I do. All right. You're on the team. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, that's a good analogy. I like that analogy. Like if you're at the court, I don't know if you guys heard him, but Charlie said, if you're at a basketball court and somebody gives a general announcement, hey, who wants to play basketball? You know, and then somebody raised their hand and then they actually, then they're chosen to play or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, so many are called, many people look at that as, as a universal call, and then few are chosen. That's a that's a particular, a particular call. So anyway, any I just wanted to point out that word election to pick out. It is used in relationship to salvation, though. Where Jesus said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have chosen you out of the world, and and so forth. Uh, cho the, the word chosen or election is used. For to relate to clearly to salvation, not just to service. Because I've heard people try to argue away election, God's election, as to say that election it only relates to, to, to election to service. And I, I just don't believe that because of all these verses here that speak of God's election to salvation. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry to him, and so forth. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world, and so forth. And that's these these verses to me all relate to salvation. The second word is prohorizo, to mark out or determine. And so these are all the verses where this word actually appears. And the word speaks of a pre-planned destiny. And Jesus's work was predestinated. Acts chapter 4, verse 28, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So determined before is predestinated. It was marked out beforehand. 
It was pre-planned. And the word prohorizo is a picturesque word. word. The word horizon, look at the word horizon. It's like the kind of like your, your vision of where it could go and the, the, the marked out point of your vision. And it's like God has determined beforehand our, the horizon of our destiny. Our destiny is the idea. So this word is used in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And it's used in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and, and 11. So it's only used a few times. You could easily research every time that word appears in the New Testament. A third word is foreknowledge, which is prognosco. And I believe that's just that's not just the surface knowledge, but an intimate knowledge. Like where Jesus said, remember when Jesus said to those who came before, did not we cast out demons and do this in your name? And he said, I never knew you. I never knew you as my own. I never knew you in an intimate way. And also in Amos, it's, it's used in this way in the Old Testament, where it says in Amos chapter 3, verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. You only have I known. Of course, God knows everybody. He's omniscient. But know in an intimate, personal relationship way. So, and this is a big verse to me. And we'll get back to this verse in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says, elect, we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So what went first? He chose us based on his foreknowledge. So what, 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 what went before election, if you could order it, is he foreknew. And based on his foreknowledge, he chose. Yes, Catherine? I don't mean the New Testament. But if we look back at the Old Testament, Noah's time and flood. If people were saved, what about those people who have not gotten to the age of accountability, who understood the plan of salvation at that time, and they were destroyed? Would you say that God had known that if they were grown up, they would have been lost, so they perished anyway? You understood what I said? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or, or you could you could look at that in, in relationship to anything. The question is, the question was asked about the days of Noah and children on earth during the days of Noah who were under the age of accountability, and then they perished in the flood. Were they saved? I believe they would be saved based on the fact that they they were still innocent percent in the sense of, uh, of not knowing their right hand from their left hand, you know, as it says in the book of, of, of Jonah, uh, and it talks in Deuteronomy. And we, that's a whole nother discussion, but I do believe children under the age of accountability are safe in the arms of the Lord. Okay, and, and there are verses for that. Okay, now, uh, the, so the word foreknowledge it's also used, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he says, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So that word foreordained is the same word foreknowledge. In other words, it was foreknown by God from the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ was going to shed his blood on the cross. It was intimately known. And these are all the verses where foreknowledge appears. So the word prognosco and prohorizo, predestination and foreknowledge, do not appear that often in the New Testament. And if you could also go to Acts, why don't we just look at one other verse related to Christ? And, and both predestination and foreknowledge are used for the work of Jesus Christ, that it was foreknown and predestinated, and yet he was even chosen to do what he did as our savior. Acts chapter two, verse 23 says him, 
that's Jesus being delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So what was done to Christ, there was a boundary marked. They could, they could do certain things and did awful things to him, but they could not go beyond what God had, if you will, predestinated and foreordained for him to, to endure. Okay. So the last three points, if you, and that's a good bit of writing there for you on page 32, if you could jot those things down. And if you go to Ephesians while you're writing, you can just go to Ephesians or you could listen. And I'll, I'm going to quote from Ephesians chapter one, and I'll, I'll ask these questions and answer them. So when were you elected based on Ephesians chapter one, verse four, it says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So I believe we have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And that choice is that we should be holy and without blame before him. You, you could read the words in love with the next verse where it says in love, having predestinated us. So, and I like Ephesians, Ephesians one is so rich, but if you, if you follow this through, it says he hath chosen us in verse four, then verse five, he has predestinated us. And we were, we were chosen for the purpose to be holy and without blame before him. Why did he elect certain people in love? He predestinated us according to the good pleasure of his will. So he has chosen us. He predestinated us. And then verse 6, he has made us. In verse 7, you could say he has redeemed us. In verse 8, he has abounded toward us, all to the praise of his glory. So why did he do it? According to the good pleasure of his will. So those are questions that, I, I mean, those are answers that go beyond my understanding to comprehend. I mean, when did God choose me? Before the foundation of the world. I wasn't there. You know? So God, God made a choice. He, and he elected according to his foreknowledge. So he chose us based on his foreknowledge from the foundation of the world. So I, I'll just close with these three illustrations. And they're not new to me, but I heard them and they made some level of sense to me as I tried to work this out in my heart. The first illustration is like the, a three base illustration, just so we could put things in order. And I would say first base is foreknowledge. Second base is predestination. And third base is election. So when I say what went first, the foreknowledge, God knew something. Then on that basis, he predestinated us. And that's from Romans chapter eight. So I put predestination second based on Romans eight. It says for whom he did predestinate. Sorry. I'm sorry, verse 29, Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Okay, so he foreknew, and then on that basis, he predestinated, and then whom he predestinated, them he also called. And I'm taking, in Paul's terminology, called is chosen. So not that this, and I don't know how much this even helps, but <laughs> does that solve the problem? <laughs> First one is foreknowledge. Then is pre you predestinated us, and then he called us. Okay, oh. problem solved. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, the two tracks. Now I like the two track illustration. Is on one track is divine sovereignty, on the other track is man's responsibility, and the the tra the tracks can't cross. Now somebody said, well, I, I told that to somebody one time, and he was so so much a, a Calvinist. He says, I, I believe in a monorail. You know, <laughs> well. <laughs> I, I, I don't see how you could get away from man's responsibility in all what God does. Man is responsible. Man, we're responsible for our sin. And we're responsible to come to Christ. So I believe both of those things. And there are those two tracks, and not to crisscross them, and not to, not to be able to even answer all the questions. I don't, I don't have it all. I can't answer all the questions. And the, the, the fourth illustration 
or the third, the Heaven's Gate illustration, this is from Ironside. Ironside said, Harry Ironside, as you approach Heaven's Gate, now this makes sense to me. This is a little more um, visual. If, as you approach Heaven's Gate, it says on the outside, whosoever will may come. Whosoever, that's what it says on the outside. Say, so, well, that's an invitation. That, that includes me. So I'll go. I, believe, I want to believe in Jesus. I want to go to heaven through Christ. So whosoever will, that includes me. So I go, and when I get inside the gate, and I look back, and I see on the inside of the gate, chosen before the foundation of the world. And that makes sense to me, because I, I believe election is not a doctrine to stumble over if you're not saved. But it's a doctrine to find immense comfort in when you're saved. When you're saved, you can find immense comfort in the fact that God, from the foundation of the world, chose you, and he's not going to let you go. That will give you comfort and assurance that he chose you. And if, if he did it that long ago, he's not going to change his mind now. You know. <laughs> Going back to the two tracks, then, um, so then the Calvinist is saying that if man does, even if man doesn't say, I believe in Jesus Christ for me, he's saying that man will be still saved in the end. Is that I'm sorry, say what If Because of man's responsibility. Yeah. Right? So if man does not confess that Jesus died for his sin, um, is that man still saved according to Calvinist, the way the Calvinists are saying? Well, they would say that God's grace is irresistible, so he would say he believes. You know, because they would say, once you have the Holy Spirit, once you've been regenerated, then you would, you would believe. So it's, it's not a matter of like, they would be regenerated one in time. So it's not like they're going to be regenerated now. And then five years later, they say, you know what, I think I'm going to believe, you know, I, I believe it would be more like, you know, something like that. You see? <laughs> Okay, and this last illustration is the great oak tree illustration. So if you start on the oak tree, let's start at the fruit of a tree. And the fruit is God, God chose his elect. You're the elect. And, and I love actually, to me, make your calling an election, sure. And Paul says, I endure all things for the elect's sake. And Colossians I love what it says, actually, in Colossians, foundationally, where he's, he's writing to the church in Colossians chapter uh, 3. And he says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God. In other words, you're not going to find the, the grace and the, even maybe the desire to fully put the, to live out your Christian life until you fully understand, I'm chosen. Jesus chose me, you know, like, wow, I've been chosen. And, and you feel that love, that, that love of his choice. So I say, and make your calling an election sure, because as a Christian, for a Christian to know you're the elect is tremendously comforting. So he says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, that's foundational and holy and beloved. Know who you are. You've been separated and loved. Don't, isn't it important for you to know that you're loved by God? So it's important for you to know that you're the elect of God and that you've been separated by God and he set you apart. So all three of those things, elect, holy, beloved, put these things on mercy. So therefore, because of that, we could be merciful and kind and humble, you know, to one another. So anyway, that's the fruit. Then the branches, he chose us, he elected us from the foundation, or he, I elected you because I predestinated you. That's a branch. And the trunk of the tree now, we get to the trunk. So we had the fruit, and now we have the branch. Is he elected us because he pre that's predestination, if you will, the branch. And then the trunk is I predestinated you because I foreknew you. And then the foreknowledge piece goes into the roots, what you, what you don't see. Now, here's the big question really, and this whole debate, and then I'll be done. The big question of the, the, the debate of Calvinism is, what did God know intimately about you that led him to choose you? 
because it says elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So what did he foreknow? Now, I this is my position. I don't know what he knew. <laughs> that's safe. <laughs> to me, that's a safe position because once if you try to go into that and answer that question, you, you sometimes just. Now, did he know you were going to believe? Yeah, he knew that you were going to believe. But he knew a lot more. And I, I just don't know what he fully knew. So I'm just going to leave that with God. What he knew that led him to choose you, um, that's, his, that's in his eternal mind. And I'm just going to let the secret things belong to the Lord on that. So therefore, I don't feel a need to answer that question. Because I don't want to like start veering off one way to the other. You know, I want to keep the tracks like this. And I'm going to first uh, Timothy as I let me just read this last verse. And. Um, and I've read Spurgeon as well on, you know, Spurgeon was a five point Calvinist, but he was very balanced and he didn't answer all the questions either. And he and I have a sermon on his on him where he really goes after the hyper Calvinists on first Timothy chapter two. And verse number four, where God says that he will have who will have all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth, and he talked about how some Calvinists would just like put gunpowder to that verse and just try to blow it up, you know, <laughs> and in rejecting it. But God says, now, so how do we take that verse in light of, of if he will have all men to be saved? Well, why didn't he choose? You see, why did I don't know. See, I, I don't fully, I can't fully answer questions like that. All I know is that God is sovereign and man is responsible and he will have all men to be saved. And Jesus died for all men on the cross. And therefore, we need to go out and preach the gospel because we don't know who the elect are. And we're never going to know. And Paul was told by the Lord, I have much people in this city. God had a people in Corinth, wicked Corinth. Such were some of you. Paul didn't know who they were. So he stayed there and he preached and they were saved. Okay. I don't exactly, I, I can't say Calvin said that in a quote, that God did not die for everyone. But Calvinism, one of the points of Calvinism is his atonement is limited to the elect. Yes, that he did not die for all men. I did a post with um, Reformation Bible College and they are Calvinists. Calvinists and they choose a specific text in the Bible. I just, it just came from the mind. They, they use that text to prove that God and that everyone teaches the Yeah. So uh, Catherine is saying that they use certain verses in the Bible to prove that Jesus Christ did not die for everyone. I think um, And I will, they would use this verse. I, maybe it's John chapter 10 and verse 15. I think this would be one verse that they could use or would want to use, where it says, as the father knoweth me, even so know I the father. So Catherine was saying that she went to a Bible college that was very Calvinist. They were using a verse to say that Jesus only died for the elect. This is a verse I've heard used in that way. Uh, as in John chapter 10, verse 15, as the father knoweth me, even so know I the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And later on, he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Was that the verse? You're not sure? Okay, so so that that's a verse that a Calvinist would use. And, and, it, and it says in Ephesians chapter 5 that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So the church being the ecclesia of the people who are redeemed called out from the world. So that would be another verse that they would use. But yeah, he died for his sheep. 
But there are other verses that say he died for all men, especially those that believe. So that's how I would say that the sheep are. They're, they're the, especially those that would believe. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> There's so many questions. Okay. We'll take a break and we're going to come back and we have a presentation from uh, Brother Charlie to start us off in the next hour. We'll take a five minute break. <laughs> 